And I, at this point, think I've been better off in the long run keeping things to my own website because I, I own it. Even though I wasn't paid for it, I own it. Yeah. So I've, I think that my, my journey as a freelancer has been learning how to recognize when something just isn't, it's not going to be a win for me. And there are some places where having a byline at a certain publication is worth more than how much you're going to be paid. Like there are some places where I'm willing to say, okay, $200 isn't much for this work, but I'm really excited to work with you. Yeah. And then there are some places where the byline isn't that impressive, but they have a wild budget. And I'm like, great, I'll write whatever <laughs> you want. I could really use that money right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you just, my advice to folks who are freelancing and figuring things out is to be very intentional with the choices you're making. Like, don't don't feel like if I miss this opportunity, I'll never have another one. Or yeah. if I'm difficult negotiating, they won't want to work with me. Or like, don't don't second guess yourself. Like, think about what is your priority priority in that moment? Is it owning this story? Is it making your rent? Is it thinking about how this will look on your resume? Like, just you're allowed to make decisions for your long-term and short-term goals and don't feel pressured or insecure. This episode is sponsored by Copy AI, a toolkit that helps writers, marketers, and freelancers skip writer's block completely and quickly create first draft copy for themselves and their clients. If you'd like to get a 30-day free trial, head on over to copy.ai backslash Jacob. Everyone, we have Ella Dawson here. She's a sex and culture critic who worked as a social media manager and freelance writer and digital strategist before building her own author audience and community via Patreon. We're going to be talking about her journey into freelancing uh, and the uh, sort of unique niches and spaces that she's been operating in. And uh, super excited to have you here. Thanks for hopping on, Ella. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You're sort of in a bit of a transitionary period here. You've sort of recently started really focusing on Patreon and also been doing some uh, digital strategy. Can you kind of tell us a bit more about what you've been working on lately? Yeah, so I left a job in the middle of the pandemic in kind of a dramatic I quit moment that I think a lot of us hit during during COVID. Yep. And I had started the Patreon just to kind of test the waters to see would my readership actually follow me to a, an exclusive pay for what you read model. Yep. I think it's it's quite frightening for a lot of writers to make that jump, especially if you don't have like a huge built-in audience like Andrew Sullivan or one of like the big names. So yep. I didn't really expect it to be the primary way I was going to be making money. But when you quit a job with no plan and you are a little too burnt out to find another one, uh, you change your plans pretty quickly. So I've been Patreon supported for I think about eight or nine months now time moves in a weird way these days but it's been <laughs> it's been really wonderful and it's given me a lot of freedom to explore different forms of writing I expected it to be very straightforward essays two or three times a month about sex but I've wound up sharing a lot of fiction um, going down some weird avenues about mental health and roommate drama and just like <laughs> weird stuff that is still very much my voice and my core values but it's been really wonderful to get to know my patrons folks like you and and uh yes indeed I love it. it's been such a delight that's amazing uh, and i i know you i think it was in april that you posted a blog about looking to hit 250 patrons uh i think that was your april goal um, and I was, I noticed you have 266 now. So first of all, congrats on hitting that milestone. Um, I'm you. curious, like, what did you, what did you do when you kind of thought, Hey, I, I have this goal. I want to hit it. What was sort of your thought process for pursuing that goal? And, you know, how has that process been? And did, has it sort of informed a future strategy that you have to continue building this, this base? Um, kind of what's that process been like? Yeah, so Patreon is really weird. I didn't fully know this when I started the Patreon that you have you have to expect a lot of churn. And like I think that for folks in the marketing space, we think about churn in terms of newsletters and subscribers. And it's very true of Patreon because you have folks who at the end of every month get a bill and have to decide, am I getting what I want from this? Do I want to stick around? Can I afford it? So I didn't expect when I joined Patreon to have a very wonky chart of how many patrons I have at any given time. Yep. So back in April, I, I think I was in like the low 200s. I can't remember where I started, but I thought 
I want to find a way to invite people to join this community that's exciting. I want to have a milestone that people feel like they're on board to help me hit. Um, people really get excited about having, about helping somebody they admire or enjoy reading, helping them reach that goal. So yeah. I kind of put on my marketing hat and I was like, how can I almost gamify this to make it fun for everyone else? And to emphasize that it really is a community. It's not just read Ella's essays. It's you'll be in a space with a bunch of other people who are interested in these conversations. Totally. So I decided to do like the April campaign to celebrate six months on the platform and invite people to join. And I succeeded. I think I hit around 260 by the end of that month. Awesome. And it's been funny when people ask me about it now, because it looks like, oh, you haven't grown all that much since April. It's now August and I'm still around 250, 260. And it's because every month a bunch of people leave and a bunch of uh, people come and stay. And at the beginning, it used to really stress me out when I would see folks leaving the community. And then I started to think about it as if someone's been with me for six months at the $11 level, they've given me a lot of money. And maybe that's, maybe they've gotten all that they needed out of the experience. Maybe their budget changed. A lot of people just leave because financially their situation changes. But it's like, if someone has given me $70 over a few months to read my work, like that's, that's amazing. I'm not going to be sad that they leave because what an amazing display of faith in a stranger to be like, here's 50 bucks. Like that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. So I'm right around 266 right now. And maybe someday I will reach 300, but I try to focus on how many new people are coming in and, and what are the comments that they're leaving and um, what's the experience like that they're having. But it's been really wonderful. I like, I get really giddy when I talk about it. Cause it's just so surreal to have people on the internet be like, yeah, here's $7. Here's the equivalent of Netflix. <laughs> so I can read your essays. That's really flattering. Absolutely. That that's really amazing. And I think the, I think the not being concerned about churn is such a big deal in like the marketing space too. I, I spent a lot of time in email marketing and it's crazy how many people, particularly solopreneurs or freelancers or you know individual creators building their audience get so hung up on like, yeah. if I send this next email, I'm gonna get 10 unsubscribers, you know, or I'm gonna get 15 or 20 unsubscribers. And that feels like personal, um, but you kind of, the longer you're in it, you kind of start to realize like, hey, like some of the emails that are gonna have like the most churn are going to be the ones that bring in the most profit for your business or bring in the most visibility to your brand. And it's just part of building an audience. Yeah. It's just part of the ball game. And you really can't know what's going on in that person's life when they decide to unsubscribe or to cancel their membership. Like it might be that they got fired. It might be that their email inbox is just out of control. Like <laughs> maybe they, they signed up because they wanted to support you, but found that your content isn't really what they're looking for, but they're still going to engage with everything that you post in other places. They might still be a customer. Like you really have to force yourself to not try to assume the worst and take things personally. Um, otherwise you lose your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And speaking of uh, losing our minds at the activity of internet strangers. Um, your journey did not start here. It started as a social media manager. Is that correct? Um, can you can you walk us through a little bit of what your career journey has looked like up to this point? Yeah, I will try to be very concise because it's been a very <laughs> strange roller coaster. I when I was in college and when I graduated college, I thought I was going to work in publishing. Like I wanted to be an yeah. author or an editor and I wound up working um, both during college internships and after college as a marketing intern for some different independent publishing houses. And I had this sense that maybe I would love to be a freelance writer as well, but I was really drawn to how to use marketing to sell books, to create community, especially to help these publishing houses that really had my values uh, at the core of their mission. And totally. I, I was a Tumblr teen, so I helped a lot, of, um, a lot of places use Tumblr and then eventually Twitter and Facebook to share their books, spread their message, connect with readers. And eventually I, I realized that's a, that's a genuine skill set. It's a mix of copywriting, it's a mix of voice and brand recognition, community development. And I wound up working for TED Talks and I was there for five years, which is kind of wild because that kind of retention at the beginning of your career is, is hard to come by these days, especially in media where everybody's getting laid off. Uh, so I was at TED for five years. I at first did some pretty straightforward content marketing and 
we had all organic because Ted didn't, and I don't think still does have a marketing budget. I could be wrong, but certainly during my tenure, it was all organic, unpaid social. And I just, I loved it. I adored it. I love finding ways to repackage the TED Talk and make it work for a digital audience that doesn't have 18 minutes. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and I really enjoyed all bits and pieces of social media strategy from figuring out what platform is interested in what topics, um, what types of content is desirable natively on those platforms. How do we yep. make Facebook video, Instagram story? How do we do lives? Like social itself changed so much over those five years to be from link sharing to a whole distribution platform for native content. Yep. And at the same time, I was still writing on the side. I, I had a blog that became pretty popular. Um, I sold a piece to Women's Health Magazine when I was 22, 23, that went explosively viral, that was about dating with herpes. And um, part of the reason I didn't become a, a more traditional freelance writer is because my experience working with women's health was so exploitative. Um, they paid me $75 for a piece that I think probably reached over a million readers oh over the years. Like, <laughs> and I granted I had, I, it was my first paid piece. Like I didn't have bylines. I, I was a newbie, but it was explosively popular. It completely changed my life. It led to me giving a TEDx talk. Like you Google me, it still suggests, do you mean Ella Dawson herpes? Like <laughs> I became a very weird niche internet celebrity overnight. And I was so demoralized by the, A, how poorly I had been paid for that piece, but also just how hands off the whole team at Women's Health was after I went viral. Oh. Um, because I was just a freelancer. Like they didn't check in on me. They weren't like, are you okay, child who sold this deeply personal essay? So wow. I, yeah. That's, and that's, that's kind of nuts. It sucks. And it's also like, that was a moment where there was this whole personal essay industrial complex. Like that was the days of Exo Jane. It happened to me. I did whatever. And so I think it was just at a moment when media was pretty ugly in the way that it used people for their most traumatic stories. Yeah. But I was just so outraged by the way that whole experience went that I really stayed close to social is my job. It is my career. And writing is something I do because I love it and I'll never make money from it. Okay. And it took me a really long time to realize there are ways to, there are ways to write that are fulfilling, but it's not going to be in the same model that I grew up expecting. Like maybe it'll be reader supported through Patreon. Maybe it'll be the tip jar. Maybe it'll be occasionally submitting pieces to places that respect you and take readers seriously. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of, it, it was wild when if you, when a year or two ago, I realized like social is still what pays the bills and I still do digital consulting, but there is a way to make money off of this. And it has to, you just have to be very creative in the way that you, in the way that you approach it, because our, our romantic notion of what it means to be a paid writer is not really the case anymore. Yeah. It's my very rambly overview, but no, I've just had a weird, I've had a weird few years. Totally. <clears throat> That's, I kind of assumed that the, uh, when you said that you worked with, uh, with Ted, that, the, that that was after the TEDx talk that you gave. Um, no. But, but uh, not that's that's how did you uh, how did you end up getting into that world in the first place? Yeah, so I the only reason I wound up working out or working with Ted was because I summer after I graduated college, I moved to California. I was doing social media marketing for uh, an independent publishing house that basically was sold out from under us and okay. laid everyone off. So at the end of the summer, I also like, I had gone through a bad breakup. I was like, I am not made for California. I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> How do I move home? And so I just, I put on Facebook, Hey, I'm looking to move back to the East coast. Does anybody know of job openings or internships in the social media space? Cause I've discovered that I really like that. And a friend of mine, um, not even a friend at the time, like an acquaintance from college who was wound up becoming a friend said, that she had just been in the elevator with this guy at her office building whose wife worked at Ted and was hiring a social media intern. Okay. And he was like, do you know any millennials who know how to use the internet? And so she sent me the job opening and 
they wouldn't have even have read my application because I was, I was applying from California and I would have been moving in with my mom in Connecticut and they were looking for someone in New York city. And my friend managed to say like, Hey, you should look at Ella's application. She'll figure it out. Like she'll move to New York. And I beat out everyone else by some wonderful stroke of coincidence. So I wound up working at TED before I had a very popular blog, before all of the herpes internet fame stuff went down. And it just happened to be a wonderful coincidence that I was in a workplace where I could say to my boss, like, hey, I kind of want to talk more publicly about having an STI. Will that hurt me professionally? Like, is that something this office is comfortable with me writing about online? Can I become a public figure, essentially, um, and still work here? Although I didn't think of it in that framework because I was not expecting to go viral. And my boss was, she's still an amazing mentor of mine. She was very supportive. And when I did go viral, she was like, go home early. You're having a panic attack. And then she called the, um, the publicist who worked for Ted and was like, can you please give my intern media training? She's very freaked out. And so everyone in my office kind of adopted me because they recognized that just like another TED speaker, I had this idea and I had all this attention I wasn't really equipped to deal with. Yeah. And eventually a, a TEDx organizer who didn't even know I worked at TED probably reached out to me saying like, hey, I read your blog about herpes. Would you like to come to campus and give a TEDx talk? So I immediately went around the TED office and was like, who can give me speaker training? Who can help me write this talk? Like, please help me. And I don't think I would have given as good a talk had I not worked at TED because I knew how to give a good TED talk. I'd watch them every single day for a year. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people assume that I wound up at TED because of the talk, but I already happened to be there, which was just a nice coincidence. And it was very funny when my talk went online because all my coworkers were like, oh, it's you. <laughs> so <laughs> was, that your first, yeah. was that your first, was that your first time public speaking? Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Cause you like had, did not look that way. Like you seem you. very natural at it. I mean, I had given like, I had given presentations in college. Like I had done little things, but I had never stood up in front of an audience properly. But one of the great things about working at Ted was they teach you how to do public speaking. And my, my boss had really pushed me into giving presentations at the all hands meeting for all 200 employees. Like I had been building some of those muscles already. Yeah. And that that winter I had given a talk at the office about writing about herpes because Ted at the time really encouraged you to have passions outside of work and then come back and teach your coworkers. And okay. so I had given like a 10 minute talk at the office about how I had gone viral and how weird that was. So <laughs> I had like been slowly building the skill but I had never stood in front of an audience of strangers before. And I had always considered myself a very introverted person too. And I wasn't expecting to have just the time of my life on stage. Like, I think you can see it that I'm a little shell shocked, but the audience found me funny. And that was a surprise. Like I watched the talk and it's, it was so long ago that I'm like, who is this cute little child? Like what a sweetie, but it was one of the best moments of my life. It was so rewarding. That's amazing. And it kind of like, it kind of fits into something that I teach my readers and the people who watch this podcast is whatever form of media you're wanting to get good at, like engage with, like consume great versions of it from people who are more experienced. And you like, there's definitely a process of osmosis of like, you know, like if you want to be really good at writing long form blog posts, read really good long form blog posts. And it sounds like for you, like the the experience of watching these great speeches over and over had a pretty big impact in allowing you to nail it right off the bat, which is just, that's awesome. That's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah. I think that's true of any field or any skill. Like that's certainly true of public speaking, but for me as a social media person, like I looked to brands that I really admired online and tried to figure out how they were writing their voice, how they were writing content that I enjoyed, particularly because none of us is like, you know what I really want to do today is follow Arby's on Twitter. Like, (laughs) that's not really the thought. It's something comes across our feed and then we're like, what the hell is that? And you can learn so much from figuring out whose content you connect with and maybe it's their writing or their public speaking or their tweets and it's you also don't have to look for those lists of industry bests like who are the people you truly find 
the work rewarding that's not a sentence whose work do you find really <laughs> rewarding on your own and yeah. who are you drawn to and how can you emulate what they're doing and then make it your own absolutely um, and it's, it sounds like your in-house tech experience with ted was pretty great and supportive then when you sort of transitioned into or or maybe i guess it was simultaneous to some extent but like your experience as a freelancer in this space has been not quite as positive. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of what your experience as a freelancer has been? Yeah. Do you mean in terms of writing or social or both? I guess all of it combined. I mean, obviously, one of the things you mentioned was the low pay for a piece of content that did very well. Is Was that unique to that situation? Or is, have you found in general that the freelance, like, the freelance budget allocated in the spaces you write about haven't really been particularly appealing? Yeah, I think it's, it really depends. It's super variable. I okay. think one of the lessons that I learned at TED, and um, this is very much due to having a wonderful manager who I worked with for many years, is learning to understand your value and not undersell yourself. Yeah. And I, TED was a nonprofit, so its salary wasn't super competitive, but I, I understood my value and I was constantly having people around me say like, you are very talented here, your skills, you deserve X, Y, Z. And so it was very demoralizing and strange to then have publications lowballing me for, yeah. for my work. And I think I, I was lucky to be financially privileged enough to say, if you're not going to pay me for my words, I'm just going to put it up on my blog and sure I won't be making money, but I will own that traffic and I will yep. own that relationship to my readers. And eventually I'll put a PayPal tip jar and some person who just had a great day at work is going to send me a hundred dollars <laughs> and I'll make more money doing it myself. <laughs> then then so, you would, they were just to pay you for it. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing that I also realized from that women's health experience was I've looked back at the contract more recently as, as a more experienced adult, and I pay so much attention to exclusivity and ownership windows. Mm. And I sold the rights to that essay forever, even okay. though it was a story that was very personal to my life. And I yeah. deeply regret signing that. And it's for me, it's like the $75, like, yeah, I should have been paid more, but I wish I still own the rights to that story. And I, at this point, think, I've been better off in the long run keeping things to my own website because I, I own it, even though I wasn't paid for it, I own it. Yeah. So I've, I think that my, my journey as a freelancer has been learning how to recognize when something just isn't, it's not going to be a win for me. And there are some places where having a byline at a certain publication is worth more than how much you're going to be paid. Like there are some places where I'm willing to say, okay, $200 isn't much for this work, but I'm really excited to work with you. Yeah. And then there are some places where the byline isn't that impressive, but they have a wild budget. And I'm like, great, I'll write whatever <laughs> you want. I could really use that money right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you just... My advice to folks who are freelancing and figuring things out is to be very intentional with the choices you're making. Like, don't, don't feel like if I miss this opportunity, I'll never have another one. Or yeah. if I'm difficult negotiating, they won't want to work with me. Or like, don't, don't second guess yourself. Like, think about what is your priority, priority in that moment? Is it owning this story? Is it making your rent? Is it thinking about how this will look on your resume? Like, just you're allowed to make decisions for your long-term and short-term goals and don't feel pressured or insecure. And if you feel like somebody's being a dick, like you can say no. I had a moment a few months ago where I had pitched, I had kind of pontificated on Twitter about an opinion and said I wanted to write about it. And someone at a really prestigious publication reached out and said, we would love to publish this if you want to write an op-ed. And I was kind of waffling because I wasn't really in the mood to be freelancing at that moment. And I said, well, what's your budget? And they said, oh, we, we don't pay for opinion. If you want to do a reported piece, we'll send you like $75. And I was like, no, screw you. <laughs> I don't need the byline. Yeah. Your name is fancy. You have a budget. Yeah, absolutely not. And I'm so oh. glad I just didn't, I didn't go for it because it's, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> it was like a well-known brand. <laughs> And they reached so. out to you too. It wasn't even like you were like trying to get on them. That's crazy. I know. I didn't pitch you. You invited me. And then you expect me to be like, oh, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Thank you for the exposure. <laughs> I don't need the exposure, honey. Like <laughs> it's just, 
say no to things if you can if you if you are in a financial position to do to do so you will very rarely regret saying no to things yeah and you've built kind of like specifically on twitter it seems like you've built a pretty solid following um an audience on there i'm i'm curious is that ever something that you approached really intentionally like hey i want to grow my twitter or is it more just you being yourself and the following showed up, uh, maybe a carryover from some of the viral articles or kind of what, what's that process been like? I wish I could say I had a super intentional strategy. <laughs> and to this moment, like I'm trying to think of what were the big moments where I had a lot of growth and it's really hard for me to even remember. <laughs> I think that Twitter especially is such a strange environment. Like a chunk of those followers have been from a random out of character tweet that went viral and that gets you a few thousand. A lot of those followers are for when I was volunteering on political campaigns. I'll occasionally do volunteer communications work. So um, I did some volunteer communications for Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016. And then I volunteered for Elizabeth Warren's campaign. And very so, cool. yeah, it's very fun. And one of the things that I really enjoyed and benefited from is that when you're in that kind of campaign space, and you tweet something along the goals of the campaign for the day, your tweet will then be shared with the entire network of volunteers who will all retweet it and amplify it because yep. they're trying to get a certain messaging out there. So I, I received a lot of growth in my followers just from doing that because it's other Democrats or other folks who are interested in politics who start following you because you have opinions. Yep. So a lot of my growth was just happen to be from volunteering. Also live tweeting debates during politics the bachelorette like anytime there's a communal viewing experience and yes. you have a unique <laughs> voice either because it's funny or informed like a lot of my growth has not been from my writing or from okay. my work it's been from people being like she is funny or she's <laughs> weird um but yeah and i i i joined twitter when i was a senior in college or at least i'd already been on twitter since high school but that was when i started using it because my um my ex-boyfriend's college roommate, who's now one of my best, best friends, was in a class with me and he loved Twitter. And he's like, let's live tweet class together. <laughs> um, and I just, I've, I've, it's always been my platform of choice. Um, but yeah, I love Twitter. I just, it's where my humor fits. And <laughs> the fact that I've wound up growing a platform is just like a wonderful coincidence. Twitter, yeah, I, I've been finding, I, I'm not, I'm not a Twitter OG like yourself. Uh, I mean, I've been on there for a while, but it's been this last year that I've been having a blast with it. I don't know if it's just pandemic sort of mood or what, but uh, well, so I've been spending a lot time, yeah. more time on there. <laughs> I think, and one of the things I think people really appreciate about Twitter is when you can blend your professional expertise with your own just id, like your own yep. pure thoughts. And so totally. I think especially in a moment like this, where a lot of us are asking professional questions about our career path and what we want to do, as well as just having a lot of existential dread. Like if you can walk that line of vulnerability, people really need that. And they need to hear from folks who are thinking about is marketing soul sucking? What do I really love about this profession versus what really do I struggle with? Like we're at, a, we're at a unique moment where showing professional vulnerability really resonates with people. Yeah. And I've seen, I have a few different friends in marketing Twitter who have gained huge followings from just being brutally honest as opposed to sharing tips. And it's, yeah. it makes me really happy because it destigmatizes being like, work is hard. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> totally. Kind of tapping into the, uh, the sucky side of life. <laughs> yeah. And like, how do we manage that? It's yeah. not that I, I hate toxic positivity and I think that it's really useful to be like this is a difficult part of our profession how do we all handle this and how can we help each other succeed knowing that this is an issue yeah and kind of talking about the the niche of the brand that you've built for yourself and particularly like the the sex and intimacy space mm -hmm. um I think one of the struggles that most people most people who approach writing with the idea of, I want to make money from writing. One of the struggles is like, there's the things you want to write about and the things that you feel will be profitable to write about. And there's that constant tension of, should I go more in the direction of writing about what I want to write about and hope there's money at the end of that journey? Or should I focus on making the money and then try to incorporate? And I'm curious if you've ever kind of had that struggle as well. Have you ever kind of thought about switching switching niches have you ever felt like oh what if I were to write in this space like maybe I can make more money and what's 
what's motivated you to, to stick with the things that you're passionate about and that given the level of authenticity that comes out in your writing, I would imagine it, it generates some, a lot of negativity towards you, you know, beyond just the positivity of people who enjoy your writing. It's like, I'm sure there's some level of, I think any, anytime you're authentic in writing, it serves as a magnet for the great and the bad. And I'm just curious kind of how over time, have you, have you wrestled with switching directions and what's kind of motivated you to stay with the direction that you're in currently? Yeah, it's funny. People talk a lot about how sex sells, but it's very difficult to make money writing about sex, particularly <laughs> when you're a digital creator, because so many of the platforms really do censor sex writing. Mm. And I think Twitter is one of the few places where there's less concern for that in what yeah. in the way that they moderate. But Facebook is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Instagram is cracking down. And I'm not a sex worker and I don't I don't I don't create pornography, although I I certainly ran my campus porn magazine when I was in college. <laughs> I've always had a checkered, I don't know, I've always kind of flirted with the line of adult content. Yeah. Um, and so it is difficult to make money through that unless unless you, I don't know, like it's, it's difficult period. And um, I never really set about, I never approached my writing as this is going to be how I make money. I always approached it as this is something that I love to do and that's important to me. And maybe someday I'll become a celebrity and I'll write a best-selling book about it. But I always knew this is not going to be super lucrative. Um, but what I realized as time went on is that if you are super passionate about something, if you have expertise in it, or if you just have a unique voice in it, there will be readers who want to read it. And sometimes you have to go directly to those readers and say, do you want to give me some money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you getting value out of this? And can you recognize that what I'm doing is work? Yeah. And so I've, it's only recently that I've been able to make any kind of consistent revenue from my work because it's, I've built up this audience over the years who trust me and who understand that if I want to dedicate even more of my time to this, I need y'all to support me as opposed to me having a day job. Yeah. And I also reached a point professionally where if you want to write a romance novel or write erotica or write a lot about casual sex, like it's very intellectually and emotionally demanding. And it's a lot harder to have a day job and work on those things on the side. So totally. I think that if you do have these passions that you want to make money from exploring in your writing, you have to think a lot about how am I going to build that audience and how do I create content that they will feel is valuable enough to support financially. Um, there are a lot of sex writers who have columns with big publications who work for Cosmo, who work, who write for Vice, either they're freelancers or staff writers. Like there are spaces for that, but it's a lot of competition for a select few positions or bylines. And for me, I, I write more essay and memoir and fiction. I'm not really a reporter. I, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't consider myself a journalist. And so I don't fit as well in those positions. I don't yeah. really want to write about the latest trend or sex toys or whatever else. I want to be like, can I talk about how distraught I was after this one night stand? <laughs> like it's a very different vibe. So yeah. I really had to just create it as I've gone along. Um, I think the biggest professional challenge for me has been figuring out how do I exist as a brand and a writer online and then have that day job? and what offices and companies are comfortable with you being one person at work and then one person online. And that's been an ongoing process. Ted was, I don't think I even fully understood at the time what an oasis it was yeah. because my, my coworkers recognized that I was very good at my job and that I was also very interesting outside of work. <laughs> and they, they weren't threatened by what I was doing outside of work. They recognized that you can be multiple things and multiple people at once. Um, I've had some bosses who were incredibly not cool about it and who saw my professional work as a threat to the brand, but also said, you're putting all this energy into your own career. You should be putting it into this job. And so those have been moments where I've had to go, well, this is not a good fit. I'm going to, I'm going to go because my brand is more important to me than this job. And I could have done both, but it doesn't coexist in your brain. So let's as it as it should be, like when, when does a, someone else's company ever going to, should be more important than your own personal brand and career, you know? Yes. And I, I think we're, this is an interesting moment 
professionally for a lot of people, because I think a lot of companies are realizing if you do want to retain talent, you have to be okay with the fact that they are human beings who live outside of work. But what I learned from those experiences, I'm not the type of person who can work at a startup. Like I want to work at an office where it is nine to five and there are boundaries. And it's not like you need to pour everything into making this company succeed. I don't care. (laughs) Like that's not who I am. Um, But yeah, I think that's been my my larger struggle is how do I work with people who do not see my own life as antithetical to what they're doing? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I have attracted a ton of weird attention and backlash online. I thankfully haven't experienced it for quite some time, but I went through a period in my early 20s where I was like a, a target for the alt-right and for a lot of reactionaries on YouTube, like the cuckoo people, yeah. not normal Republicans, but like Milo Yiannopoulos types and that could not have been fun (laughs) oh my god and like I was definitely a drama queen about it like I (laughs) like in retrospect like I was very I was traumatized and petrified but I also was not like as big of a target as other people I was a cisgender white woman from Connecticut like I was not getting it as bad as a lot of folks but um, it taught me a lot about how to have boundaries online how to stay sane online um and just it was wild. That's a whole other conversation we could have, but the internet is bizarre. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned uh, going into sort of the romance novel, uh, that sort of direction. From what I've heard, that's very much in the forefront of this next stage of your journey. Um, what sort of the, what are your sort of your plans with that? Um, are you looking to incorporate that into the uh patreon at all or your your brand building is it or is it mostly going to be going through like a publishing house or kind of what's what's the game plan with that and where are you hoping that it takes you yeah so i am very lucky that um i had a few essays go viral that attracted the attention of literary agents and so over the years a few different agents have reached out to me saying like do you have a book in you do you want to write a book about herpes do you want to do xyz and i wound up connecting with an agent who I adore named Jamie who very diligently kind of watched my career and at periodic moments would be like, what you got And um, to her credit. Like I had been working on um, the way that she works is she doesn't sign people until there's like an actual project, whether it's a proposal or a book, like something tangible. Yeah. So over the years I would be like, here's a bunch of essays for a collection. And she would be like, politely, this isn't very good. Go do something else. (laughs) Um, and so eventually when I left Ted, I had a bit of like a, a, a mid late twenties, who am I existential crisis? And I, I just loved romance novels. I had become a really avid romance reader and I wrote a romance novel in a few months. Um, I was taking like a burnout break from work. I had savings. So I would just go to the Brooklyn library every day and write this romance (laughs) and, a lot of it is about millennial angst and working in media and getting laid off and like <laughs> capitalism is bad kind of stuff. Um, although it is like an escapist romance, but I wrote it and I sent it to her and she was like, this is, this is messy. It's a rough draft. You got a lot of work to do, but it's great. And she signed me. Um, and That's awesome. It's, it's wonderful. And I adore her and I love the book. It is a hot mess. I don't <laughs> think I ever understood that when you write a novel, unless you're insanely talented and lucky, you have to write that novel like eight times. So I've done four major rewrites. um, (laughs) And like, I'm also realizing if you're a a debut novelist, like you're not going to make any money. So I know that I'll probably in the long run be making like 50 cents an hour by the time I ever see money from this book (laughs) in terms of the amount of time that's gone into it um, and the amount I will be paid if it is even published someday. But the hope is that I'll put it together and it'll be good enough to go to a real publisher, either a romance imprint or one of the big five, hopefully. Um, I've explored self-publishing. I've thought about it before, but I think it's a good book. And I think that it, I would hope that it would go to, um, I want it to be in bookstores, but uh, romance I think is is a very interesting space because there is a huge opportunity to self-publish. There's a huge opportunity to use Amazon and and e-readers and just like, write weird stuff and share it with your audience of readers in whatever way romance readers spend thousands of dollars on romance books because you can read a romance in like six hours and then you immediately want to read another one Mm -hmm. and so 
the amount of romance titles that are sold is bonkers. And so I think that it is, it's a space where you can be incredibly creative as, a, as an author of, of maybe you go the traditional route in publishing, maybe you do it yourself. So I'm having some fun sharing chapters and excerpts on my Patreon to give people a sense of like, you're paying my rent. This is what I'm doing with your money. I'm working <laughs> on this um, with the understanding that like, if it's ever published, it'll probably look very different from this excerpt, but like, this is what's on my screen right now. And it's fun to get that feedback and to share that with my readership but we'll see I I have a draft that's in my agent's hands and I'm hoping to hear from her in September and hopefully she'll be like you made some progress now go rewrite this again um <laughs> and I will deal with that email the time. When it comes. Yes. I it, it feels like most of the people I've come across who are making like pretty large amounts of money from self-publishing are often doing like serials sort mm -hmm. of low, low length, probably pretty quickly written, extensive serial series on either, either the romance genre or the mystery genre. Um, mm -hmm. And I, yeah, so I'm curious, have you, have you thought of pursuing that route, maybe even in addition to the other? Is, is the other kind of one of those things that's such a full, such a full extension of yourself that doing anything more than that and what you got to do to pay the bills is kind of like, I'm tapped out for this season. Let's focus there and then we'll we'll pivot it maybe after that. <laughs> I mean, I wish I were the kind of writer who could just crank it out because I think in my deepest fantasy, I would be the type of person who would write a new book every six months and just keep churning them out and telling yeah. those stories and having fun. And there are some people who can work like that. I just am, particularly for my fiction, I, I just can't. I don't have that many ideas, um, but I... It's funny growing up, my parents were always like, you're gonna wind up being a romance novelist. Like we already know you're boy crazy. Like you love to write fiction. Like when I finally did write a romance, my parents were like, what took you so long? <laughs> um, but who knows, like maybe something, maybe I will wind up living in a cabin in Maine and just crank out romance novels in a serial format. And that'll be amazing. But for now, this is how my creativity is wired. And it's gonna be five years working on this one book and then I'll be like don't ask me about another one here's the book that's all I got <laughs> we finished this one <laughs> maybe uh maybe another time <laughs> yes <laughs> so, so how long has this process been so far I started the rough draft in the first draft in I don't even remember September October 2019 okay. and then I I think it took me like three or four months to write the first draft and then I was like it's done and then I sent it to a bunch of friends and they were like this is bad but congratulations <laughs> <laughs> and so I would like put it away for a few weeks or a few months and then come back to it and reread the entire thing I've rewritten the ending so many times that I I shared it with my friend Gabe and he had read the first draft and then read the fourth draft and was like this is a totally different book um so at this point I guess it's been almost two years and it's coming along. <laughs> we'll see. Slowly but surely. Yep. Making progress. But it is, it's an astronomically better book than the first draft was. And so I try to remember as much as it sucks to like delete entire chunks, every version winds up being so much stronger. And my agent always says like, no matter how much time it takes, you want it to be the best possible book it can be and stop giving yourself a hard time about not publishing a book before you turn 30 because you would rather publish a great book at 35 than a shitty book at 29. Totally. So, yeah. yeah. And that's a, I mean, that's kind of a, a great point to, again, kind of mention to those watching this, the, the reader base that falls right by. It's like the same applies for any, any form of writing. Like mm -hmm. I think so many people come in to the writing space with all this pressure to be like a really good writer right off the bat and to spend so much time researching about writing, particularly with like copywriting, researching about copywriting so that they can feel they're a great copywriter on the first draft. Nobody is a good writer on the first draft, like yeah. especially when it's your first time. Like, I mean, yes, there are authors nowadays who have published 10 books and can sit down and write a great first draft, but like, that wasn't their first book. You know, it's only after you've done it a lot that you get to the point where you, you start doing it better and better from the first draft. So, you know, if you are, if you're looking at your writing right now and thinking this sucks, that's what it's supposed to, it's supposed to suck. You know, it's supposed to be bad and it's supposed to require some drafts to get to the point where it's something you're proud of. Um, and I think, 
you know, kind of like everything you're saying here, like there's people who take the approach of I'm going to write something bad and publish it and just publish high volume. And, you know, and, and I think in some spaces there's a, there's a viability to that. Um, I think to some, to some degree, some form of publishing before you feel like you're good is important because you start getting feedback from other people. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you want to really do high level work, it's going to be a process and it's going to require a lot of sending stuff to people and having them say, this is terrible. Here's how you can make it better. <laughs> yeah. I, I recently was, when I left TED, I ported over my inbox uh, to like a backup so that I could keep it after they shut my account down. And I found like, I found the feedback that my boss had given me when I had just started at the company for like the Instagram captions I was drafting or the headlines. And like, I did not know how to do anything. And <laughs> But I had a raw talent that she yeah. recognized and I learned those techniques over five years at TED. And it's the same thing when I look at my essays and my blog. Like if I look at the blog posts I wrote in 2014, they're garbage, but they were good enough that people connected with them and I kept going and you refine your voice no matter what, no matter what writing skill it is, whether it's copy, whether it's romance novels, whether it's description product blurbs, like you learn and you practice and you get feedback and it's not supposed to be easy. And if it's, if it feels easy when you're right starting, like it's probably not as good as you think it is, yeah. but you have to be really humble and excited to learn and excited to be told this is bad and here's how to fix it. Yeah, you you yeah. don't get to the good draft without writing the bad draft along the way. Like it's a necessary part of the process. Yeah. And there are people too, like some of those best-selling novelists, especially when it comes to mystery romance, like the genre books, they got ghostwriters. Like they are not writing two books a year. If you reach that huge level of fame and name recognition, yeah. they have teams behind them. And that's yeah. also true of like the social accounts that you love from major brands. They probably have many, many people working on those things, many sets of eyes, many revisions, even if it's like a tweet that's designed to seem like it was kind of tossed off that got workshopped yeah. <laughs> <laughs> worth remembering that very true very true like I yeah at a certain level they're selling the name more than the actual writing you know mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point though I, I think a lot of people really are blind to that and they look at some of these accounts and think like if I want to be successful I need to personally be able to supply that level of productivity and it's that no. literally doesn't exist. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for hopping on, Ella. This was, this was a blast. Um, for, for those watching, what's the best way for them to connect with you and follow your work? Yeah. So you can follow me on, follow me on any social platform with the handle bros and pros because I write pros about bros, which is yes. a brand I chose when I was in my early 20s. And now I'm like... <sighs> Still true, unfortunately. Um, uh, so you can find me there. You can also go to elladawson.com to read my work and then patreon.com slash bros and pros if you would like to give me your money. <laughs> absolutely. Worth doing, by the way. I'm a subscriber and it's great stuff. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Absolutely. Yeah, this this was a blast. It's, it's really cool to get a dig into sort of a, a space that is not typically connected to the freelancing world. We talk about marketing and tech and all this stuff the vast majority of the time. And uh, yeah, it's been super interesting. I think it'll be super helpful. Thanks everyone for watching and uh, I'll catch you guys in the next episode.